from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Leslie Johnston, and I'm the Acting Director of the National Digital Information Infrastructure and Preservation Program, or NDIP, and I'm happy to welcome you all to the library for this event in our NDIP Digital Preservation Series. Um, word about NDIP, NDIP is a digital preservation organization at the Library of Congress. We have over 300 partner organizations. The goal for our program is to build capacity for digital preservation nationally and build a national collection of digitized materials and born digital materials that are very much at risk. And it is in this mode that we are holding this series of speaker talks at the library about digital preservation, the preservation of born digital materials in particular. Uh, the library is dedicated to the preservation of all materials, born digital or digitized, and we'd like to let people know for anyone that's interested, the PBS NewsHour is actually airing a show tonight about the library's Packard campus down in Culpeper, Virginia, and what they're doing to preserve sound and film collections. So we very much encourage anyone that is here tonight or watching this later to go online and check that out. But on to why we are all really here, as I'm personally really thrilled to be introducing our speaker tonight, because I started listening to his music in the 90s. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to date myself and him. Um, Ian McKay. Mackay. Mackay, yeah. I, you know, I, I know that. But uh, Ian Mackay is the founder of a number of bands that we have all heard of, including Minor Threat and Fugazi. And he's a key figure in the punk and post-punk music scene, especially here in the Washington, D.C. area. You know, his espousal of things like the DIY ethic and the straight edge philosophy is influential, not just locally, but internationally. Um, he currently performs in the duo The Evans. Evans, yeah, yeah. So, um, but the other reason that he is here tonight is that he's well known as the founder of Discord Records, uh, which has a part as, of its mission, the preservation and distribution of local Washington, D.C. music, and it is in this citizen archivist role that we really wanted to bring him here tonight to speak to you. So please welcome Ian Mackay. Thank you. Um, well, first off, sorry, I'm going to have some water here. I, I met this fellow, Butch Lazarchak, right? Um, some months ago, and he has the unenviable task of working on a project uh, archiving every web page. Is that correct? Something like that? Well, you're part of a team. It's only a few billion. Yeah, which I came here to visit him, and he, I said, what are you working? He said, we're, we're actually archiving every website. And I said, wow, have fun with that. Um, <laughs> anyway, he's a nice guy. Everyone here I've talked to has been nice. And they invited me to come talk. He said, do you want to come down and talk at the Library of Congress? I said, if people have questions, I'm happy to to talk. Um, I don't usually have, I don't have any presentation to be honest with you. What I can tell you, uh, just to speak a little bit to what uh, my introduction, uh, how I was described, uh, I will date myself. I'm 51 years old, so consider myself dated. Um, and uh, I started playing music in 1979 when I came across punk rock, which was this incredible discovery for me. Growing up in the late 60s and being a part of or being witness to sort of the social upheaval and revolution, seeing the civil rights movement, uh, seeing the anti-war movement that was happening, being really inspired by those things as a child, and also thinking foolishly, as it turns out, that this country was progressing beyond such ridiculous pastimes. Um, I entered the 70s thinking like, okay, when I'm like an adult or a teenager, once I realized I wasn't going to go to Vietnam, you got to remember being born in 1962 and thinking in my head like, okay, when you're 18, you have to go to war. So for the first 12 years of my life, 
I figured, okay, I'm going to go to war. It wasn't until 1974 that they said, oh, you know, war was a terrible idea. We're out. And I said, okay, I guess I'm not going to go to war, which was a good thing. Um, then I discovered <clears throat> that the 70s really, there was nothing going on. Like I would look around and I couldn't find any sort of counterculture. I couldn't find any kind of attraction with a, with a community of people that felt like they were challenging conventional thinking. In fact, what I mostly saw were just people who were getting high. That's pretty much what I saw, especially um, in high school. I went to Wilson High School here in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, I loved all my friends, but so many of them were just partying. Uh, and it seemed like such a, uh, I don't know, disappointing that that was the only form of self, uh, only form of rebellion that they could come up with, which was self-destruction. I was never interested in that at all. Um, I think actually uh, being witness to sort of the self-destruction that I saw in other people around me and also in musicians that I was a fan of. I'm a lifelong Jimi Hendrix fan and knowing that he put it into himself ultimately at the age of 27. Janis Joplin, who was another hero of mine who also died at the age of 27, um, that I thought, I'm not going to get near any of that stuff. Uh, I want to be here every moment. I want to be present every moment. However, there was nothing going on, so I became a skateboarder. Um, skateboarding is not a hobby, and it's not a sport. Skateboarding is a way of learning how to redefine the world around you. It's a way of getting out of the house, connecting with other people, and looking at the world through different sets of eyes. When you're a skateboarder, especially in the 1970s when everyone thought it was a hobby, they all thought it was a, like a strange version of a yo-yo or a hula hoop, um, <laughs> I think that they, you know, I think that at that time, it was, it was very under the radar. So for most people, when they saw a swimming pool, they thought, let's take a swim. But I thought, let's ride it. Let's see what the transition is like at the bottom. When they saw uh, maybe a, a, you know, the curb or the, a street, they would think about driving on it. I would think about the texture. I slowly developed an ability, I think, to look at the world through totally different means. I had a whole other idea of what was happening. Weather played a very different role in my life at that time. If it rained, like today, would be a miserable day for me. In 1978, my more illuminated friends in high school started listening to New Wave which I thought sucked because that's what <laughs> the party line was. And New Wave sucked and punk sucked. Um, and I argued verisifully in, in defense of Ted Nugent and Led Zeppelin. And, <laughs> and I said that, you know, I was really against the Ramones and against the Sex Pistols. And also it's worth pointing out that my knowledge of these bands was largely coming through mass media which of course is a dubious source at best. <laughs> I don't think I can even go give it that much credit. Um, <laughs> finally, a friend of mine said, have you actually listened to New Wave or Punk? I had not, which made my argument slightly ridiculous. And <laughs> I borrowed some records from a friend and also from my sister. Um, and within these records, there was the Sex Pistols and the Ramones, The Clash, first album, The Dam's first album, a whole series of bands that were confusing for me, band I'd never really heard of, record covers that were scary, music that was unrecognizable as music. It was, didn't make sense to my ears, but my ears had been trained by the radio, which is a dubious source at best. 
And I've used this analogy before, and I'll use it again. That if you grew up eating a hamburger and french fries every day of your life for dinner, when someone puts like a delicious bowl of pho in front of you <laughs> or a rice vermicelli dish, you would not recognize that as food or dinner. But it is dinner for a lot of people in the world. And it's better for you than a hamburger and french fries, see? So it took me a moment to get my mind around what I was listening to. The first song that really connected me was a song by the Sex Pistols called Bodies. Sex Pistols are a much more straightforward band, pretty straightforward in terms of being kind of recognizable as a rock band. But they had a song called Bodies, which is a song about an abortion. This is subject matter I had never heard anyone sing about, ever, period. I'd never heard anyone cuss on a record ever before, ever. So this was very scary territory, which is exactly why I was drawn in. Because when you see something that scares the shit out of you, go towards it. You're about to learn something. Um, so once I cracked that, I thought, this is fascinating, because I realized at that moment, and I imagine for most of you, you've had a similar moment in one field or another, where you realize there's a whole other layer of life, a whole other layer of culture. There's something that you'd never even realized, but you just found the portal, the entry point. This was extremely exciting for me, when I realized that these, these few albums represented thousands and thousands of musicians and bands around the world that I had never heard of, didn't know they ever existed, knew nothing about it, but now it was mine to learn. The first show I saw was The Cramps at the Hall of Nations at Georgetown University in 1979. It was February 79 or May, late January. Again, a transformative moment, walking in and seeing a room filled with people maybe six or 700, maybe 800, I don't know how many people. Virtually everyone there challenging some conventional idea about how to live, whether it was a musical one, obviously, a fashion one, obviously, but also political and sexual. I think that they were challenging everything they could think of in that room. And I thought, I am home because this is where the counterculture exists and this is where I want to be. Because the mainstream has always felt to me to be a toxic journey, one that ultimately supports hideous endeavors like drone attacks. A hideous endeavor, horrible on our dime. So I was in. I had to quit skateboarding at the time because skateboarding, all the skateboarders th just thought punk was ridiculous and called me terrible names. That was all right. It was a fair trade. Then I realized in this newfound world that I could now play music because there was an audience built in. I didn't have to be of a particular caliber of a, you know, a player because I really didn't know how to play. And I was glad that I have to be a particular caliber because it wasn't that I was bad. I just wasn't. Do you follow? I wasn't at all. And I learned how to play bass only because the other three people in the band picked the other instruments. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll figure this out. I played piano before, so I had a rough idea. We can figure this out. First band I played in was a band called the Slinkies. We played one show. One at a party on MacArthur Boulevard. One that almost canceled because the guy whose house it was got into trouble with his mom. <laughs> and she canceled the show. And I was outraged. <laughs> so I sent her a letter saying, I understand that Brian did wrong. <laughs> but he's not in our band. <laughs> and it seems unfair to crush our dreams <laughs> on behalf of his mistakes. And she wrote me back a letter saying, I am a psychologist. And if you think I'm going to fall for that, you were wrong. 
the show happened. <laughs> Who's wrong now? <laughs> then I, <clears throat> the band, our singer went off to college, sadly, one of my dearest friends. So we had another singer, and we changed our name to the Teen Idols, I-D-L-E-S, Idols. Good name. And we started to play music. At this point, we'd seen the Bad Brains, who are from here, Washington, D.C., one of the greatest bands of all time, period. Such an inspiration, a band of um, the, the, their discipline, their talent was undeniable. And being able to see them up close and to know them and to realize that they were from Washington, D.C., that was profound for me because I'm from Washington, D.C. I'm a fifth-generation Washingtonian. And my mother said, this is a good town. You don't have to leave. You get all four seasons well represented. <laughs> I had no intention of leaving, but anyone who knows if you play music, they say, we got to move to New York. But I wasn't moving to New York. There's no way I'm going to New York. But that's where everybody seemed to go to play music. And then to see a band like the Bad Brains and realize they were from Anacostia? Come on. And to see them work and to understand like their dedication to their craft was so inspiring to us. So we practiced and practiced and practiced. We played for a year, no records, because at that time making a record was kind of a sellout thing. Because you're, cause a record is a commodity, right? So if you made a record, like what are you trying to do? Make money off of this thing now? Because that was totally the opposite of punk rock. You're not supposed to make money. You make shows. You're a point of gathering. It's why we all got together. It's why we're here right now, actually. Um, and I'm not getting paid for this either, by the way. Or am I? <laughs> <laughs> nope. I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. um, I like this podium, by the way. Um, so we went a year with no record. This is telling. We played here. The first show the Teen Idols ever played outside of Washington, D.C. was in Los Angeles. That's our first tour, four days on a Greyhound bus. And that shows you our commitment to not playing New York, see? <laughs> we heard about a punk scene on the West Coast that we thought was pretty cool. And we're like, well, let's go play it. So we booked a show there. It was four of the four band members and two roadies, two. And the best part about it is we brought a guitar, a bass, and a pair of drumsticks. Why do we have two roadies? <laughs> One of the roadies was Henry Rollins, my best friend since 11 years old. He came with us. So we got to LA, and we played a show in which we made $15. That's it. And we got there, we assumed, because that's the way you do, that the band will let you use the gear. But that's not the way they roll in L.A. We said, which gear do we use? They're like, what are you talking about? Like, well, we just brought our bass and guitars. They're like, you're crazy. We had to beg them. And we finally, they let us use their equipment. And then we went to San Francisco. We made $11 up there. In fact, we went to San Francisco, and we were on a great bill with the Dead Kennedys, Flipper, and Circle Jerks, and the Teen <laughs> Idols. And we got there. And the guy who ran the club, Dirk Dirksen in the Mubuhe Gardens, dropped us because he didn't like the picture we sent him. He just didn't tell us. We'd been on a bus at that point for five days to play this one show. So then some other people, friends of ours out there, like interceded on our behalf and begged him. And he finally agreed, OK, they can play the next night. So we played the New Wave night in front of like seven people. I remember we played with the wrong brothers. Get it? Not the right brothers. See? <laughs> Lost to Angeles. That's the kind of band we were playing with that night. Anyway, I don't mean to digress. The point is, Teen Idols, we played for a year, and then we broke up. When we broke up, we had saved every dollar we'd ever made. And it was in a cigar box. A cigar box, which I still have. So when we broke up, Instead of splitting the money between the four of us, each getting, you know, 200 and some dollars, we decided that we would document the music that we had been making. Because we had recorded 
a demo tape at Interior Studios in Arlington. It was a keepsake. It was a yearbook. It was evidence of something that was very important to us. So we decided to make a record. I didn't think that anybody would care about it except for our 15 friends or 20 friends. But at that time, you had to make a minimum of 1,000 records. But we figured, why not? Just spend the money and we'll see what happens. You can imagine, by the way, the interest that labels around the country had in a teenage punk rock band from Washington, D.C. that had broken up. <laughs> like, I mean, people often say, like, why did you decide to put out your own record? I'm like, are you kidding? Like, no, there was no interest whatsoever. We didn't exist. There wasn't even, I mean, it wasn't that we weren't on the radar. It just, it just didn't, we weren't even a part of anything where the word radar could be used. It just, we were non-existent. So we decided to make this record. None of our parents are from the music business. We had no idea how to make a record. So we just asked one friend of ours who had done, had put our record, said, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, here's a phone number, call them. So we called Nashville Record Productions down in Nashville, Tennessee. And they said, just send us a tape and send us a check for $500. Okay, got a money order, send it down there. Then we took a, it's a seven inch record, right? We, we took apart a picture sleeve from England. We pulled it apart to see how it was configured. So you can imagine, you know, seven by seven, if you open up, it's 14 inches with a little kind of flaps on the side that fold in. So we just opened it up, we sketched it on the 11 by 17 piece of paper, and then we put our own art into that. We just laid it out on there, and then we took that to a print shop and said, can you give us a thousand of these? Which the guy ran them off. In a week we picked them up, 11 by 17 pieces of paper with this weird shape art, and then using scissors, and glue, we cut and folded every one of those record sleeves. That is the way Discord records work for the first 10,000 records. By hand, cut and folded every one of those sleeves. That, my friends, is the record industry. <laughs> that is the true record industry. It was incredible to sit with people, your friends, and make records together. It was an amazing experience. In the time it took us to make that first record, other bands were forming. So we decided that should we actually sell these records, which we weren't certain we would, we decided that we would use whatever money we made to put out another band's record. Now Henry, at that point, was singing for a band called SOA, State of Alert. And he decided that he didn't want to wait for us to put the get the money back. So using money he had made, being the manager at haagen Ice Cream in Georgetown, <laughs> where I was one of his employees, by the way, <laughs> he paid for his own record and said, any money that comes from that can also go towards Discord. At that point, it was just on. The decision was on that we were going to document something that was profoundly important to us, and that is our scene, the punk scene here in Washington, D.C., and that's how it really began in terms of the collection. The idea that something important was happening that we were part of, not important necessarily to the world, but important to us. That's it. Like, I'm not a hoarder. People, some say, are you like a hoarder? No, I'm not a hoarder. I'm not a collector. Like, I don't, it doesn't give me a thrill to get some, you know, rare, I don't give a damn about any of that. I really don't, I don't care. However, if there's some evidence that something positive or creative or constructive is happening, that's moving to me. And I like to hang on to that sort of thing. Now, it doesn't hurt to be 52 years old and having only lived in three houses your entire life and having keys to all three of them. The house I was raised in in Glover Park, my father and sister still live in. Discord House, I lived for 21 years. That's in Arlington. I own that house and the house I live in now in Mount Pleasant. So if you don't have to move, it's a lot easier to save things. I feel for you all <laughs> holding that clutch of letters like, ah, I don't know, maybe it's time to say goodbye to this thing. Not me. I never really say goodbye to those things, especially letters, because those seem especially important. Our mother always saved her letters. And at some point in her life, she decided that she would go through the letters from 
like she would keep them by uh, author from her friends, and she would go through, and with a typewriter, she would type up all her favorite sort of sections of the letters. So she made little kind of digest versions of the correspondence, and then she just sent back the whole bundle of letters to the person. So imagine being a steady pen pal, you know, you know, for years, and then 30 years later, getting a bundle of your letters and your handwriting. It's kind of cool. My friends have something to look forward to. I can do the same thing. Should I take questions? What do you think? Or am I just, should I keep on going here? Have I answered any? Have I talked about the archiving thing yet? <laughs> All right, I'll say, well, let me say one more thing about <clears throat> the archiving spirit. Um, because I think it's maybe a, a blood problem, a blood thing here. Um, my father's mother, my grandmother, Dorothy Disney, Dorothy Mackay, her pen name was Disney, she uh, wrote a column for the Ladies' Home Journal called Can This Marriage Be Saved? It was one of the earliest advice columns. Um, it was a, essentially a, a column where she would interview a man and a woman who were having a difficult difficulty to their, their marriage, and then a counselor who would weigh in on their problems. It was, I mean, it's a little bit of a, there was a trick. It was a trick thing. She retensed it. It had already been sorted out. But it was a way of, you know, it was interesting. Like she was writing these columns up, and she started to, um, at some point when, she did shorthand, of course, but at some point when tapes, cassette tapes especially, came into use, she started using those as a way to, she just recorded the conversations. I don't think she used the, them to listen to. I think she actually relied mostly on her shorthand. But she kept the tapes. Um, and I keep coming across boxes of tapes of these people in their, like in the 1969, 1970, talking about like all the hassles it is, you know, all the hassles they're having, and how their husband's bawling somebody or, you know. <laughs> That's 60s slang for having sex, people. <laughs> Thanks to my sister for laughing. <laughs> At some point, my grandmother made a very strange decision that she wasn't just going to tape these interviews with these people. She was just going to tape everything. So I have tapes of my grandmother in the back of a taxi cab, lost in Los Angeles, screaming at the taxi driver. <laughs> at one point, the ca taxi driver saying, you sound like my father. She goes, well, your father must have been very disappointed in you. <laughs> I have tapes of my grandmother. She would, <clears throat> I have a series of tapes called Dorothy Works the Phones. <laughs> she would tape her phone calls. And I have tapes of my grandmother talking to me when I'm 12, driving me crazy, like just working me. Just, you can hear, and when, now that I actually have, like you can hear, like she, my grandmother didn't, di did not drive. So she was always trying to figure out ways to get people to give her rides places. And being, once I got a driver's license, I was on the list. <laughs> but now that I hear these tapes, I always suspected that she was up to something, but now I have proof. Because I can hear her calling different people, going down the list of people, and then getting to me and giving me this story and make like, okay, I, uh, you know, it's eight in the morning. Like, are you still asleep? Well, of course I'm asleep. I'm 16, you know? <laughs> um, anyway, I have these, all these tapes. And then our mother also started running tapes. Just tapes. She just run tapes in the house. Just her playing cards. I think the original idea was she, she had this idea, she and her friend had this idea that they were going to, and do you know what Scattergories is? The game, it's a tile game like Scrabble. But they had this idea, they, or no, sorry, Anagrams, not Scattergories, Anagrams, that's the one, that's the tile game. And she and her friend had come up with this idea, they were going to invent noiseless anagrams. And noiseless anagrams are basically anagrams or Scrabble like tiles, but on cardboard, so they don't go clack. That was it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so then they, they thought they would, in their de product development, they would also include in the package recordings of what a noiseless anagrams game would sound like, see? 
So she just ran tapes. But a lot of those tapes just have kids. We just walked in and out of the house because the tape recorder was just on. So there was just something about this sort of documentation, these moments, they're really nice. And do, you know, and there's also like tapes of them, my parents arguing, you know. There's really interesting things, things that most people, like, you know, my mom died in 2004. And up until that point, I remember going into the house, coming to the house, and she would turn on, like, I'd come over to play cards, and she'd put on, she had a little Panasonic tape deck, and she would hit play record, and we would just talk. It, at some point, you don't even notice it. I'm not, you're not thinking about it. And I used to think, I used to think, it's really nice. Like, Mom, you know, because I was traveling a lot, and I said, Mom likes to listen to me. Like, she likes to listen to her kids. You know, it's a nice way for her to spend time with us. It was not for her. It was for us. When she died, I was like, oh, I get it. It's for us. Like, these tapes, to hear her voice, it's fascinating. To hear her in just general conversation, really nice. It's a nice thing. I have a lot of friends who, uh, whose parents have died, and they, say, they, they encourage them, oh, I will never hear their voice again. This has changed, I think, now with the perverted um, amount of documentation that's going on. The fact that everyone is carrying a documenting module in their pocket. But still, it's, it's something that these tapes, they are really, they're, they're, an, they're in, it's incredible to have these things. And I'm slowly in the process of digitizing those as well. I have a lot of projects, too many projects. Um, let's take a question. Who has a question? Yeah, wow, that was fast. Um, Marianne McJagger said that it would be ridiculous for him to be playing I Can't Get No Satisfaction when he was an old geezer in his 40s and had the Rolling Stones on their 50th anniversary. And some people still feel that rock and that silk are like a young person's game. Have, has your musical taste and attitudes changed significantly since you were like in your 20s and your did you all hear the question? I'll repeat the question. Um, starting off by talking about Mick Jagger singing, saying that when he was in his 30s or 40s that he would thought it would be ridiculous to be singing I Can't Get No Satisfaction in his 60s or 70s, and now seeing that he's actually on tour, um, uh, the questioner brings up that people, many people think of rock music as a young person's form. Is that a fair some of that? Do I, has, have my taste changed as I've gotten older? Um, my favorite kind of music is music made by people who don't have a choice in the matter. So punk for me is still relevant, like the stuff, stuff that I cut my teeth on. But so, of course, it's Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, as I mentioned, Nina Simone, Fela Kuti. Like this is music, like I'm interested in music coming from, and it doesn't really make a difference what it sounds like in terms of the genre. But I'm interested, I feel like the music beyond the racking designations Music beyond what the Stones or Mick Jagger, whatever he was trying to, you know, whatever he's trying to do when he was doing this press conference or answering these questions, whatever he was selling, beyond all that, like music is something that is far more profound and far more sacred. Music is a form of communication that predates language. That's how I look at it. So in my mind, like the music industry has cheapened music uh, because they want you to think like, What's the new thing to listen to? Because that would then compel you to buy new records. Um, I don't buy a lot of new records. I have not bought a lot of new records uh, in the last 30 years. I mostly study music that I, I'm pulled to because I'm interested in not what's being sold to me by the media, but rather what I trip across in my exploration, in me, my spelunking, right? Like, I'm interested in that. I like to go into the cave and find things. Every once in a while, some, and usually if you, are in, if you are sort of involving yourself with other people who are also in this sort of same spirit of the search, then you get tips. You know, people send you things. The Internet, in some ways, is an incredible gift for that because finally there's access to so much music – you know, that is out there. You can hear things that you've only ever heard about. Um, I do like that. I do like that aspect of it. I like the fact that it's freed it from the sort of the tyranny of the, the record industry. Um, and it's, it's a good moment right now, actually, to point this out, that I always ask this question, what is it 
that record labels sell? And I can ask you all, what, what is the answer to that? What is it that a record label sells? What are they selling? Any guesses? What's that? Like a brand. brand, any? Any thoughts over here? Products. Products, any escape, other? Escape, escape experience. Escape. Here's, my, here's my rap. Record labels sell plastic. <laughs> That's what they sell. They're not evil, they're not bad. I have a record label. But record labels sell plastic. The plastic they sell has become more attractive to you or to the buyer because of the information that has been infused into it. It's essentially the same as the difference between, like you have a baseball cap that's blank or one that has the Washington Nationals W on it. You know, why you would pay more for that is because the hat maker, in theory at least, has paid to have the rights to put this W on the hat. So essentially what record, record companies are selling is plastic. That's what they have been selling for 100 years. I heard a fascinating interview with a guy named Dave Alvin from The Gears in LA, an early LA band, who said that record players and start out as pieces of furniture, that furniture companies were making them, and that they started making records as a way to get people to want to have this attractive piece of furniture, which was the phonograph, into their house. That gives you an idea of the role music has always been consigned to, the shill, the thing that is selling the product as opposed to sort of the point. Um, record labels sell plastic. And the reason I know this, why I'm so sure about it, is that the stuff they, they want to sell is the stuff that has to sell the most. If it doesn't sell enough, they drop it. They're not interested in the level of the music. It's like, that's just, you know, do you think that all these greatest selling, the best selling records are the best songs? Come on. <laughs> Unlikely. Um, I don't think this is bad, by the way. I'm not saying this is evil. I'm just saying it's just something to think about. So if you back away from that and you realize that music was here before the record industry, by a long shot, like a long time, thousands and thousands of years, if you're with me, and don't believe in creationism, you know? If you think that, like, all right, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been making music, it was never, you were never able to bottle it before. It wasn't until electricity came along they figured out a way to make a product. At that point, they enjoyed a 100-year monopoly. Then the Internet came along and screwed things up for them. But they're still trying to figure out how to wreck the toll, the toll booths. And they'll, they'll do it because they got Congress on their side. It's just for those of us who don't want to engage in that to figure out how to get around their silly toll booths. Uh, you had a question, sir? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that everyone has this pocket documenter, like um, this ability to instantaneously capture a moment and share it. It's mass and democratized, so like almost everyone has it. Do you feel that waters down the profanity of documentation? Do you feel like that wears down the value? I think that it, <clears throat> do, you all, do you hear the question? His, oh, you want me to repeat the question? Okay. I had mentioned earlier that everybody has a pocket documenter, which is, of course, the, the telephone thing, the cell phone thing. Uh, do, uh, now that it's, everyone can do it, does he, the question is, do I think that it waters down the, how would you describe it? The, the, like the, the value of, of documentation. Um, I think it, what it does is it increases the interference of documentation in the moment. Um, I think if people are constantly thinking about capturing things, they're not actually present for the things they're trying to capture. I'm quite sure of this. Um, I also think it's in insane how many pictures have to be taken these days. Um, <laughs> I've gotten into a situation now, you know, when I play a show with the Evens, and in the show I sell records, and I'm happy to have a chat with everybody. Like tonight, you know, afterwards, I'm sure I'll say hello to everybody. If they want to say hi, I'll say hi. But I talk to people. I like talking to them. And then the question, dude, can I just get a picture of me and you? I'm like, oh, let's, ooh, let's hold off on that. Because I will be there for an hour and a half taking pictures of me going like this. So 
something's wrong. <laughs> Something is very wrong. I do think there's, I'm not sure if it is lessened the value of, I mean, true documentation, the fact you have a way to record something at the moment that it's happening, that's pretty incredible. So there's actually, I've been thinking about this, like some of this stuff, like when you, you start to see like, my God, there's a picture of that? That's crazy that someone actually had a picture of that. And if you think about historical events, and not always bad ones, I understand like people immediately think like explosions or whatever, but I'm just saying just down the road, you think about historically, you would read about something that happened and like, God, I wonder what that looked like. But now you don't really have to wonder because if you're not taking the picture, the government is, right? They're, you know, they're filming us all the time. So um, it does, it is, it's a weird, it's a weird time. I, all I can, I have to say, we just have to hold our noses, I think. We just have to just realize that there is a level of documentation that is just the, like, it's just a chattering. It's just like, it's just, it's like noise. And that beyond that, um, people who are truly documenting are going to figure out a way to puncture that. I am concerned about doc, what is called documentaries these days. Um, I find the current form of video documentaries to be very disturbing because they have narrative arcs. And I don't think life has a narrative arc. It has many narrative arcs. So when I see documentaries where I'm, my emotions are being pulled and I'm being pulled through this like, and then this happened, and then, oh my, you know, dun, 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 and you're like, come on, this is crazy. If you look at early documentaries, there's no narration at all. It's like, here's a camera, here the, here's, what's, like, here's what's going on, experience it, figure it out. That seems to me to be, that trusts the viewers to engage on some kind of intellectual level. I have seen documentaries in which I am a part of, or my story is connected to, and I can tell you that it may be a history, but it's not my history. For instance, I think that with a lot of the punk rock stuff, when I hear like the, the narrative about the punk rock experience, whatever, there in this American, the American punk rock experience, there's a lot of credit given to Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan gets no credit at all from me, period. <laughs> you know, the only thing he did that was really pretty notable, I mean, I could go through a long list of things, but he somehow defied the Indian curse. Does anybody here know about, know about the Indian curse? I think it was Andrew Jackson that was messing with the Indians, and they said, okay, that's it. Every president elected in a year ending with zero is going to die in office. And they did. Starting, I think, who's 1840? Anybody here? Come on. It's the Library of Congress. All right, 1860, Lincoln, right? Lincoln died in office. 1880, Garfield died in office. 1900, McKinley died in office. 1920, well, that was before. You've, we've been through this with you. That's my father. <laughs> Don't need that. He predates the curse. 1920, it was hard. He died in office, right? 1940, Roosevelt died in office. 1960, Kennedy died in office. 1980, Reagan he got shot, but he lived. He broke the curse. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, okay, the, um, <laughs> that's why we were here. We wanted to talk. Anyway, um, I don't know why I told you that story. Oh, you know why I was telling you that story? is because it's a faux narrative, this idea that Reagan came along. We're like, no, we're going to form punk bands. That's not what happened. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, sure. The question is, uh, he came across an article that, written by Henry Rollins for the LA Weekly in which he discussed our visit to the Library of Congress. Was it last year or a couple years ago? I don't recall. Um, yes, that happened. And uh, what are my thoughts about the visit? <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, I was born and raised in this town. I had never set foot in the Library of Congress ever. Isn't it crazy? Because, you know, 
for me, Capitol Hill, it might as well be Boston. I just don't, I'm like, I'm from the other part of town. I just don't, I just don't know. I just never come down here. I don't have any, I feel no connection really to the federal government at all. It's like the big factory in town. No offense to the, any of you all who work for the government. I'm just saying, I just don't, I've never felt a connection. My parents were not government people. My dad was a newspaper man, you know, like I just didn't, I just never felt a connection to it. Um, but then a friend of mine who works in the book repair department, uh, she invited me down. She had worked on me uh, on my archives, which is part of the reason that we're here, actually. Um, and she invited me down, and it was pretty incredible. I have to say, I, I was pretty blown away to see their craft. Like, I mean, I never thought about this, but these books get wrecked. So every day there's just crates and crates of wrecked books being sent down to this little shop in the corner of this building, and these people were working away, putting them back together, and doing it very well. Um, then I got to go look into the rare books re um, repair room. They have some old books in there. <laughs> and I remember there was a book, um, uh, uh, Susan, uh, oh, what, do you remember what it was? Susan? Susan B. Anthony, that's right. Susan B. Anthony had given um, a book of like, a, med a book of like, um, like a Merck manual kind of book to a friend and she inscribed in it and said like, you know, I don't know, this, this works for me, check it out. I mean, essentially that was the tone of her inscription. And like our mother hand out the Merck manual all the time, like here, check it out, this might, yeah, look it up for yourself. And I was really, when I saw that, I was like, it really, it was humanizing. I got it, Susan B. Anthony, she's not just a coin now, right? Um, then uh, we took a walk around through the downstairs and I realized it's like a city here. There are a lot of people who work in this building, a lot. And they have, in the basement, they have these long tunnels that has a railing between, along the middle of it. One side is for the people who are allowed to go on there. The other side is for those who are not allowed to go on that, the special lane. The special lane is for the, I guess, the guys who move stuff. Does that sound about right? They push. The guys who push things and, but it's definitely a, you're split. You're not, you're not crossing that barrier. Um, <laughs> then I think I met Butch on that visit. And he was upstairs collecting every web page in the history of the world. <laughs> then when Henry came to town, I said, hey, do you want to go down to the Library of Congress? He said, yeah, let's, I'd love that. Cause he'd also, I think he had been in the reading room but he had never been in the bowels. So we had a really, it was great. We went to the music, oh, I went to the music room the first time too. It was great, fascinating. When I go to Culpeper, very interesting. Very nice to meet people who work here because I don't, I had no, I really have no clue what goes on down here. Um, it's a little overwhelming. Even this particular talk, Butch asked me if I would do a Q&A. I said, yeah, sure, I'll do something. And then people, I started getting these emails like, oh my God, congratulations on doing a Q like Library of Congress. Are you kidding? I just didn't think about it. I was like, I'm just going to come have a chat with you all. So, um, <laughs> so it's nice. It's nice. You know, I'm, 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 uh, it's, it, it's a crazy place, the Library of Congress. But there are a lot of people here, most people even, if they're not just protecting their own jobs, they're really, really, really concerned about taking care of the things that have occurred in this country. That seems like a good practice. Um, does anybody have any question on this side? On this side? I don't want to. Yes, sir. The question is, do I have a system for processing these materials? And do I have uh, a way to avoid basement floods? Yes. Do not put things in the basement. <laughs> That's for real. I don't, and if you do put things in the basement, if you only can put it in the basement, put it on blocks, for real. Because you're probably, if you're gonna get water, it's probably just gonna be a couple inches deep. I know so many people who are just like, you know, that one day they just like had moved something. And I was like, there's no such thing as like a minute on the floor. That's just curtains, you know. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit about 
the biggest audio collection I have is the band Fugazi. We started to play in 1987. And our first show is at DC Space, which is at a small club at the corner of, uh, not, no, I'm sorry, not our first show. Our first show is at Wilson Center um, at um, 15th and Irving Street, Northwest. And that particular show, uh, we played some friends of ours who were, you know, this guy, Seth Martin. Um, he just ran a tape because he was mixing, he was, do, he was doing the sound from the front. And it just seemed like a nice idea. We had no records out and we had been working on these songs, you know, for a year, writing and practicing and practicing. So in a way to have documentation of that first show, it was just nice to hear it. It was just nice, oh, cool. Like that's a real, we have a tape. And then the second show we played, I think was at, at DC Space or St. Stephen's Church, I don't recall, but each time we just were running tapes and it was mostly a way just to hear what the songs sounded like in that context. Um, I have a, kind of a philosophy that like a song isn't really a song until it goes into somebody else's ear you know so the same way when you have it when you play a show when you play a concert and you actually present these songs hearing evidence of that transferal is is nice and it was, it was a way of you know like okay we get the idea of what's happening here so in the very beginning we just we kind of like oh here's a tape of the show great we just listen to it maybe and then just put it you know on the shelf then when we travel, people say, do you mind if I record the show? I said, oh, no problem. Just give me a, send me a copy of the tape. So we would, you know, play maybe in Spokane, Washington in a very strange, like, youth center in the basement of a former bank or something. And, um, and they would, and then at some point down the, you know, a few weeks later, somebody would just send me a cassette in the mail and I'd just, oh, cool, put it on the shelf. Then in about 1990, Joey P., who was an old friend of ours who did sound. He was a sound man. He started doing shows with us, and he was mixing our shows in Washington. He would sit at the front doing the sound. And he just started running tapes because he was interested in the process of recording shows. We asked him to go on the road with us, and he said, would you buy me a box of tapes? And we said, sure. So we bought a big box of, you know, good cassette tapes, you know, the gold ones. <laughs> gold tapes and um, he just started running tape every night in the beginning it would just, it would just we were just I don't we didn't weren't right we just were okay great we have these tapes we come home and we wouldn't listen to the tapes because let me tell you so if you're playing six and seven nights out of a week and you're driving every day four five six hours you know what you don't want to listen to on that drive <laughs> is yourself because it's horrible it just drives you crazy because you just it just because the experience of playing music being in a band when you're on a stage it does not bear any resemblance to what they, it sounds like on the tape the next day i often think it's probably something akin to someone filming you having sex or something it just doesn't look so good on you know you just does <laughs> it feels a lot better at the moment um but slowly this pile just started to grow. We just took boxes. We'd come home and there'd be a box of tapes we'd just stick into a closet, literally into a closet. We did not listen to these tapes. At some point around 1991, we'd already had about 300 tapes. And we said, what are we doing with these tapes? But at that point, we couldn't stop, right? Because <laughs> it was just, that was just part of the, the routine. Just record, record, and just put these things away. So we had this idea that we would start a, we would put in our records a flyer that would list all the recorded shows and then invite people if people wanted to order them from us we would do a one-to-one -one cassette copy it's an unsustainable idea <laughs> cooler heads prevailed and uh well that idea went out the window but we kept playing and we just kept piling up the tapes then, <clears throat> by the time we stopped playing, which is our last show was in the end of 2002, we had played about 1,100 shows, almost 1,200 shows. We had about 800 or 850 recordings. And they're just sitting in boxes. And we had no idea. No one could go through them. What do you do with that much material? I mean, it's a, our shows were 
last few years were two hours each. That's a lot of recorded material. What do we do with this material? Do, and we said, well, maybe we could make a live record, but what would it be? Would it be one show? Just one show? Do we pick one show out of all these shows? And what's the criteria? Like the best sounding in terms of the audio or fidelity? Or the most eventful in terms of like the part where the skinheads rioted or the, you know, the police shut it down or do you do or the best performance? Like there's the criteria was impossible. We could not figure out what we were going to what we were going to do. We didn't know how to do it and that we were incapable of picking one show. Then we thought we may well just pick one song from different shows. But which ones? And ba again, based on what criteria, it was too much. It was too much. There was a brief moment where we picked out, we just sort of randomly picked out about 20 or 30 shows and we tried to just, um, we made cds of these shows we call it the fugazi live series it was in the early 2000s and we just sold them for 10 bucks each or eight bucks each or something and we made very small runs like a couple thousand or something um but the logistics of that were, were difficult because you ha again you have to make a minimum number and you actually have to make there's plastic involved obviously and um another one of my philosophies in terms of the record business is that you know what, what's another word for a record you don't listen to? A piece of trash, right? It doesn't exist. If you just have a record, you don't play it, it doesn't, it's, not, it's just a piece of trash, and the world is filled with that already. So I'm very sensitive about the idea of making 10,000 to something if I can only, only 500 people ever want to hear them. That's 9,500 pieces of trash. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to make that kind of mess. So the 30 CDs we put out, you know, People bought them and it was good, but it was also um, impossible. That's 30 out of 850. That's a, we had a long way to go. Um, and then the internet is a, it's a miracle in a way when you think about it. Like suddenly there was this possibility in which you could make one source and have an infinite number of copies. And then suddenly it was possible and the band could agree to the idea, like instead of having to pick one show or, or what so one or two songs or picking a, so a song from different shows, we are comfortable with just put it all up and let them figure it out. <laughs> so the process began with a guy named Peter Oleksik from who was an archival arts um, student at NYU. And Peter Oleksik came down, he made <clears throat> me his thesis. Um, he had come across my collection while researching another person's collection and saw it, and he's like, whoa, can I make you my thesis? And I said, sure. And he spent probably two months just going through all the tapes, entering them into a, like, you know, he created a database. And, and those are the live tapes are 850. We have hundreds of practice tapes and other, uh, other ephemera. He went through everything. He really worked hard, and he made a database. So for the first time, we actually had some logical organization. Then I had another person go through the thousands and thousands of photos that I had accumulated, and she was able to um, put them into some organization by tour and identify where most of these photos were taken. So now we had visual sort of evidence as well. And then the flyers, which uh, the aforementioned Lindsay Hobbs um, had come, and she had created a database for the flyers. And scanned them all in. So suddenly we had all these materials, and then we created the website, a website, in which all of these materials are made available. So the idea is that every show we played will have a page um, on this website. If there's a recording, eventually it will be posted, and people can buy it. We asked for $5 because we played historically $5 shows. But if people really can't deal with parting with $5, even though they're gladly pay $15 to watch a 3D movie, um, but if they can't part with the $5, uh, they can choose $1 if they want. Um, here, I'll show you the thing. Can I show them? Can I do this one? Let's see if I can make it work. So here's, ah, there it is, okay. Can you see this thing? All right. So this is a show in Flint, Michigan. And you can see here, this is, the flyer, and there might be a photo, let's see. Well, okay, here's the, f this is the main page. So this is the beginning. So you can see all the shows are listed. You can search by year, city. You can search by song. Every song we, so if you can go like, you know, if you like the song Blueprint, for instance, 
you just do that and then well you're supposed to do something and then you can search where's the go button on this one so it shows you every show we've posted in which we play the song blueprint um i think it's interesting um <laughs> here's a city we played i love this because let me go back um what i love about when we did this it was incredible how do i get out of this thing so this nyu student did all this no well he did the he did the database. I actually was the one who kept all of the, I kept all this other information. Okay, so yeah, when we were working on this, sorry, look at, so this is the cities. This is crazy. Look how many cities we played. <laughs> I felt like, man, oh. <laughs> we did some, that's a lot of cities. That was heavy. I remember Guy, Guy from the band called to so like, have you looked at the city list? There's a lot of cities. Um, what's that? I see New York. Well, you know, for guys, we buried the we buried the hatchet in New York. <laughs> um, actually, Meyer Threat did play years. Teen Idol's never played in New York, but um, but you know, it's all good. I got a lot of people up there now. Um, so we started so this is the so here okay so here's our first show is it our first what is that oh this is a different okay well here's the let me go back to this thing so i don't know how to okay so this is the um there's our first show at wilson center so there's a flyer for those of you who are interested this is a fl in the beginning fugazi was a three-piece see there's me with long hair and brendan and joe Guy was a really good friend of ours and we were trying desperately to get him to join the band and he wouldn't. So I had Ian Fanonius from um, the Nation of Ulysses draw this poster and make Guy the waiter. <laughs> I thought he would love it. He did not love it. <laughs> he was furious about it. Um, so I think, let me see if I go to the next show. There might be some, so these, here's, a, here's me with my long hair. So. This is another Wilson Center show, I think, or St. Stephen's Church in the lunchroom. So, so we, these are you know, photos. Any kind of ephemera that we had, we'd try to stick up. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more photos. We do like four, three or four photos per show. Um, but you can see I kept notes, the date, the venue, the door price, which I think is interesting, um, how many people were there, a band called Sarcastic <laughs> Orgasm opened for us. Um, there's Joey Picuri. He's the, our friend that did the sound. Uh, this is the person who mastered this particular show. Uh, and then the source was a cassette. Our rating system. Now, the rating system is controversial. <laughs> and I believe that when we update this thing, we're going to get rid of this rating system. And I'll tell you why. In the very beginning, we thought... Okay, first off, check this out. So this actually is a sample. So people can, you can hear this. You can hear it for yourself on the side. You can rate it your own damn selves, all right? But the original idea of the sound quality was that we thought we should give people some indication, like this is terrible sound, mostly warning them that it's going to be terrible sounding. So we originally thought, okay, we'll do like a four stars, like we'll do a, like four stars, and that'll give people an idea of like rough quality. But the person who was rating it thought the one star was the best. <laughs> So we had had hundreds of shows. And I said at some point, it's like, man, you're really pretty hard critic on these things. <laughs> I go, everything is poor or, or like just good or poor. And he goes, no, it's all excellent or very good. And I was like, but it's one, two stars. He goes, yeah, one star is the best. I go, no. <laughs> one star is not the best. So then the person who was helping me build the site, Alec Bourgeois, who designed the front end of this thing, I said to him, he goes, what do we do? I said, just invert it. It's complicated, though. It's hard to invert. You, you know, you think like, okay, so now two equals three. If it's just, who knows? I, nobody knows if this is, what these are. But what I found out, like, in other words, it's completely abstract, really. Like, what is good? And what does it, what does it mean? What is good? Like, is it the, the sound quality is good? Or, like, for me personally, the greatest shows are not the ones that sound perfect, but where something is transpiring. Like, we played a show uh, in Dallas, Texas in 1990. Um, maybe we can f find this here. Uh, in 1990, we played a show. Do you want to drive? Why don't you drive? Um, 
of Dallas, Texas, 1990, Canton Warehouse. Um, and which, at that particular show, the, you know, the band had gone in, we had set up, these people would let us play in their warehouse. It was a totally illegal spot, fair enough. But they were nice people, they're artists, they had a warehouse, they said, yeah, you can have the show here. And um, you got Dallas? Yeah, that's it. So, okay, good. So, <laughs> looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> so these people said, yeah, you can play in our warehouse. So <clears throat> we got there, and it's a big space, and there was a lot of kids there, and there was a, we were really working hard. They had built a stage on the top of a wrecked car. It was like a trashed car, and they built a stage. They're artists. So, and they, it was going to be a nice night. At that time in Dallas, there was a big skinhead problem, and there were two gangs. One was a gang uh, called, I think they're called the Confederate Hammerskins, and these were white power, Nazi kind of skinhead guys. And there was another gang, I think called the DVB, who were anti-Nazi skinheads. So they had both descended en masse, like they had all come down to the show, and they were gonna, like, I guess, settle it. Um, <laughs> at the show. So I went out to, actually we, the band was like, this is like, we actually called for a meeting. We said, listen, I understand you have difficulties with each other. <laughs> this is not the place to sort it out. So I'm gonna ask you not to wear your jackets in this show. You can fight out in the streets, but not here. These people have let, let us use their, their house, essentially, to do the show. Um, I have the craziest memory of this particular meeting. Could I really, it's to the degree where in my mind now that the, the guy from the white power group was like wearing a monocle or something. I just, <laughs> but I don't know, I think maybe I'm, my brain is filling that in now. So, but they agreed, they agreed and we had, um, they were, it was peaceful, there was no fighting. The first band played, a band called Last Rites. Then the stage collapsed. So now the stage did a very weird lean, but it seems like it's not gonna go any further because there's a wrecked car underneath it, see? <laughs> so we set up on the stage, it's pretty rickety, but you know, we are there. And Fugazi, like we had a principle, which was the gig. You play the gig. Like we, people are there, we are there, we're gonna make it happen. Like we never miss shows. It wasn't until 1996 that we ever actually, I think maybe we had missed two shows prior to that. Once because our van blew up in San Francisco, and once because Guy couldn't get off the floor in, Dal in uh, Austin, Texas. He was crawling around and screaming because his stomach, something terrible was happening. Um, and we didn't make it to Phoenix. But we never canceled shows. For us, it was the gig, very important. So we obviously had bartered this negotiation with these two warring factions. The stage had collapsed, we were still gonna play, and then right before we went on, the police show up. This is Tim right here. You see Tim? I, re I know his name is Tim because he kept calling me Ian. And I finally looked at his badge and said, well, Tim. <laughs> I said, well, Tim. He said, you can't, this, this show can't happen. I said, well, Tim, it's going to have to happen because these people are here. So he called the fire marshal in. And the fire marshal looked at it and said, nope, like, you have, you have no exit signs and no fire lanes. So the band and the promoters, these people who live in this house, they weren't even promoters, we and the audience worked together and we got people to move. We created exit lanes. We used duct tape on the floor. We made exit signs above doors. We made sure the, we worked for an hour, <laughs> all right, while the crowd stood there and we made, we followed there, we got exit lanes, we got exits, signs, we made sure everything was clear. We went back up, and Tim said to me, um, show's off. Go tell him the show's off. I said, I am not going to go tell him the show's off. I said, if you want to cancel the show, you can tell him. But I'm not going to tell him that. That's not going to happen. I said, we worked hard. Everyone here has been nice. All these kids have worked hard to make this, to make this go. And I said, I'm not going to do it. So there was, he, then, he said, he, then he told me he was going to arrest me for trying to provoke a riot. I said, I'm, you're, I'm not the one, that's you. Like, you're the one with a gun. <laughs> you can see that we're negotiating here. You can see that Guy is not happy about the negotiations. <laughs> Finally, after much discussion, 
It's decided that they will let us play, but that the audience has to stand outside. Yes. <laughs> in the street. This was insane. But they said there was the only way we could play. We had to play to an empty room. We could leave the sort of garage door thing open and the sound could spill into the street and they would close the street and kids could stand and dance in the street. And that's what happened. I don't know why that was a better idea, <laughs> but it happened. So check this out. That's me telling the kids they're not happy. <laughs> this is us. This is the police making everybody go out outside. Everyone is bemused. <laughs> There's Tim. <laughs> I love this. This is us looking outside the gate to make sure that people aren't being beaten. Between songs, we would run down and climb up and look out. We played to an empty room. This next picture kills me. This is kids jumping off of parked cars. You see the kid's foot? <laughs> How is this a better idea? <laughs> and again, it may be my own mind filling in the blanks, but I have this recollection of bonfires burning across the street. <laughs> to me, this might be a better show than the excellent quality one. These are really incredible ones. We you know, our concept was to play as we were. If we were mad or sad or happy or glad or whatever, we just dealt with the element. We never used a set list ever. We just played what occurred to us at that moment. It was interactive. It was reactive. Um, so the sound quality issue really didn't make any difference to me. But what I found when we did our first sort of report on what shows had sold the most, um, I was blown away to see that the show that had sold the most was a fairly nondescript gig in Los Angeles in 1998 or something. Not that it was not, not a bad show, but just a, nothing particularly interesting happened, I don't think, but it was rated excellent. And I thought, whoa, like, so it's just the rating. And I talked to some people and they said, yeah, that's what people want, they want guidance. But I think, again, Going back to my spelunking concept, I want people to get to the mouth of the cave and want to go down these things and learn what's there. Don't tell them what, like, where the fried egg like, stalactite is. <laughs> like, don't, don't do that. Let them find it. Let them go look. So I kind of feel like, forget, f forget this rating system. Let's, let's let people discover for themselves. I want to show you one more thing here. While, for, so you can see that, um, to down, does this show up yet? Yes. Where is the, okay, so you see here, oh yeah, so here, here's a little description I put up, trying to explain, and then here's the songs, and the last thing you can see, it says, outside the gig, somebody sent me a recording that he made, he was going to record the show, but then of course he was put out in the street, so he just recorded outside on the street, and it's an amazing document of all, you just hear kids ah, jumping around, you hear in the background, <laughs> You hear like a little bit of music kind of echoing down the street. And then at one point you hear this guy say, dude, hold my keys. I'm going to jump off a car. So, <laughs> um, so I just want to point out one more thing here. So here's our buy for five bucks thing. But if you don't want to pay that, you have a different price in mind. You can just click here. And then you can pay six bucks. See? <laughs> or... You can pay a dollar, or you can pay a hundred dollars. It's up to you. I have to tell you that most things that we do are funny to us. I think most people don't realize that about us. We just think it's funny. Um, I love the fact that it goes to six dollars. It just kills me every time. Do you want to pay five? Pay six, fool. But um, <laughs> but if you do it, if you pay six bucks, you have to write here. Why? <laughs> and
And I did a talk uh, at another uh, webinar th or something or other, whatever it was, and someone said, what do you do with the commons? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> there's absolutely there's no, it has no bearing on any, it's not like there's a special code or, it's just whatever, people, you could just put the letter M a hundred times, it doesn't make a difference. It's just funny to see. And everyone is very studious, like I'm a student, I have very little money, or like, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't really like your band, but I want to hear this show. Or I only want to hear one song. People put in these really good, I mean, I have to say, I enjoy looking at them, but they have no bearing. So now you know the inside track. Um, there's a lot of these shows. And we now have been working on it for four years, and we have about 300 shows up. We still have 500 to go. This is an insane project. It involves the digitization of all the cassettes and the dats. We digitize them, make them into files. Then those files are mastered and then edited. So they're individual songs. It is crazy. It's a crazy job. And honestly, like the amount of money we put into it, not counting the hours, like it's not making any money. But man, just the idea of splaying it open just saying, here it is. I mean, maybe somebody in this room gives a damn, maybe not, but somewhere down the road, some kid very much, much like me is gonna be interested in like what was happening. And most of the time that in the past, like what was happening has always been sort of um, curated by the major label industry. Like they're the ones who've decided about the history of rock. If any of you remember that incredibly informative history of rock that was on the PBS channel some years ago um maybe in the was it late 90s they had this like the pbs history of rock documentary and it was incredible because it starts out like the, the punk chapter was great because it's, it's like you know the sex pistols were playing the ramones and then nirvana and <laughs> so that's like a a serious like 15 year jump like whoop um but meanwhile right here in the united states there were kids Kids, kids, like 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year old kids who for the first time really were writing their own songs, putting on their own shows, putting out their own records, putting out their own fanzines, creating networks, touring around the country. And I could tell you stories about tours that would just raise any parent's hair. I mean, it's crazy, this stuff that was going on. But this is happening. And it was completely under the radar. And it never, it didn't even, nobody in the major label had anything to do with it whatsoever until that, you know, that familiar odor of money made it over the, over the mountains to them, you know. And I don't mean, again, I don't think they're evil. It's just, that's just their nature. They just got to work like that. But for PBS to just skip over this profoundly important chapter of American music history, uh, it's disappointing. And it calls into question all histories and all documentaries. Um, that's what I've learned about being a part of something that is considered history, is that it is really questionable, like what actually happened. There's a lot more to the story. This is maybe a, um, I don't think it's a vanity project, but I like to think that it does at least lay it all out there for people to check out if they are so inclined. Um, what else are we gonna do with these tapes? And right now in this country, and for those of you who are in the library world, I'm sure you know this, there are people, people who are collectors with a capital C, who are sitting on incredible collections of recordings and other books and so forth. And they are, they are holding onto those things. For them, it's a financial concept, a fiscal thing. Like they want it, they're like, they're not gonna let this stuff go because they feel like they're sitting on a gold mine. But in the process, they are not sharing something that is deeply important, which is culture. I know about people who have amazing collections of recordings, unbelievable thousands of tapes, and they're in their basement, rotting away, too close to the water. And when that person dies, are we done? You all right? Five minutes, okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Available digitally. 
in terms of oh sharing and file sharing sure um i'll just very briefly um every song i ever wrote i wrote to be heard so if i was given a choice then 50 years from now like i could have a dollar or knowing that some kid was listening to a song i'd go for the kid listening to the song i think that the internet has made the possibility of studying music and like it's so it's so it, people are able to do that now i do it all the time in terms of file sharing i have no problem with it whatsoever um very briefly i can tell you a story about the evens going to south america for the first time the evens are my partner amy and i were two-piece um we went to um, south america went to chile brazil and argentina in, in 2006 or 2007 and we were invited to come play and we kept and we were invited by people who had brought Fugazi down before. They were Fugazi fans. And we were a little bit nervous because we don't have distribution down there. And we said, oh, you know, we're not Fugazi. We know, yes, yes, we know. But just so you know, we're not Fugazi. And they said, yes, of course, we know we're not Fugazi. So we got there to Chile. Our first show was in Santiago. And we set up and we got to this room and it was huge. And a lot of people came, like 600 people came. And Amy said, we are screwed because <laughs> these people are expecting to see Fugazi. And I was like, I, I, you know, I don't know. It's, you know, it's going to be awkward because we're nothing like Fugazi. <laughs> we started to play our first song. A significant portion of the audience started to sing along with us. This was it felt insane. And I've used it again, I'll, you know, I've used it before, but this was, it'd be as if, like if you were asking me a question and then everybody else in the room started to ask the question along with you at the same moment. You're like, How, what's happening here? That's what it felt like. It was like, I couldn't understand it. And Amy and I were both looking at each other like, what is happening? And then it occurred to me, like, they don't have the records. They have the downloads. And this is, they weren't buying those things. I said, you downloaded this. And people were like, well, huh, what? And then, <laughs> and I said, you did not pay for this, did you? And there was silence. And I said, thank you. Like, can you imagine writing a song and then hundreds of people, thousands of miles away, being interested enough to actually, like, pull it off and listen to it? and listen to it well enough to know the words, that's a gift. The internet did something good at that moment. That was good. If people insist they only want free music, they're going to run into some problems. There's two realities, as far as I can tell, in terms of free music. If you only want free music, if you don't want to pay for music, get ready for your music to be suffused with advertising. That's already happened. You can't hear anything without like getting it through some car company or some liquor company or whatever. That's already, I mean, music has always been beaten by these companies, but it's getting beaten even worse now. The second thing is have fun with the past because you can't make music for free. The only music that is potentially free is that which has already been recorded. Now, there is more music recorded than we'll ever be able to hear, so it can keep people busy. But it doesn't do much for moving culture along. But I'm not worried about it. Because I think people will support music. I think people will continue to want to hear new music. And we are going through a process, an evolution. But music can't, it can't be stopped. It was here first. It's going to keep on coming. And the people who make it can't be stopped. People are like, now what do we do? They're like, what do you think they were doing all those other years? You know, hundreds of years, people were walking around playing guitars. We're going to have to figure this out. We'll figure it out. Can't be stopped. Can't be stopped. Do you have a question? No, it was just a comment. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I was going to ask you if you uh, had fun at the Maboon Day because I had the experience of going there to see the Hoovers and Carl and Diane. Wow. New Wave-ish. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought the Maboon Day was interesting because it was a Filipino restaurant by day and a club at night. Right. So did you eat there? <laughs> She's asking me if what I recall about the Mabuhe Gardens, which was by day a Filipino restaurant, by night a, a punk new wave club. That's the place I had mentioned earlier about playing there in 1980. I did not eat there. I had no idea they actually served food. Um, <laughs>
but it was a destination. It was a very legendary club in our mind, and we knew about this place. Again, these were these venues around the world, like around the country and then around the world, like 930 Club, for instance, and DC Space here in Washington. But there's rooms around the country where people were sort of allowed to present these new ideas. And I think this is very important. Like, what, you know, People ask me, like, what is punk? And this will be my last thought because I'm getting some stink eye from this guy over here. Um, <laughs> um, they say, what is punk? Like, what is punk? How do you define punk? Here's how I define punk. It's a free space. It's just a free space. It could be called jazz. It could be called hip hop. It could be, could, could be called blues or rock or beat. It could be called techno. It's just a new idea. For me, it was punk rock. That was my entrance to this idea of the new ideas being able to be presented in an environment which wasn't being completely dictated by a profit motive. The problem with the profit motive model is that most venues, the income is being generated by the clientele. The clientele is the audience. There is no audience for new ideas. So you have to either be referential or genre-centric, whatever, but it's very hard to have new ideas. But punk rock, in my mind, was a place where the people who were involved with it were just, they were prepared to be the audience for whatever people put on stage. I understand that the media has done an incredible disservice to punk rock by showing it as being nihilistic or self-destructive, uh, moronic. Um, I understand that. It's easy for them because it scares them, and that's what they like to do is like scare us too. But what I can say about that is that there may have been elements in the punk scene that <clears throat> were nihilistic or were self-destructive. What's more important is that there were so many creative people who continued to contend with that fact, who continued to identify with and as punk rockers, who created so much music. To me, that's the real, that's the real message, that these were construction workers willing to put up with adverse conditions. That's punk rock. And I feel like that the movie Hate Gardens and these other places, they were like rooms where that sort of thing can happen. I don't, when that place closed, I didn't think that's the end of it. It's always gonna be another spot because ultimately it is the people. And that's why, whether it's called punk or not, punk can never die. Thanks. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.